Hello everyone and welcome to a very frosty December morning here in the United Kingdom. Today I have brought you, courtesy of channel fan Steve, something very, very unusual. Possibly the king of the British cue cars. Now if this is your first visit to the channel I hope you're going to enjoy it. And if it's not, I would ask you please to hit that subscribe button if you've been enjoying what you see because it really does make a very big difference to me. Anyway, today's featured car. MG Rover weren't having a brilliant time of it in the late 90s and early 2000s. They were making some really good cars that were popular with certain crowds. They had the little 25, 75, which is popular with either the elderly or the young crowd, depending on which one you wanted. You had the 45 and ZS, which in MG form was praised as one of the best handling front wheel drive cars ever by Tiffany Dell, someone that really knew what he was talking about. And in the late 90s was someone that everyone listened to. And when the Rover 75 came out, it was praised as beating all of its contemporaries from BMW, who just bought MG Rover, and Jaguar as well. But still, nothing unfortunately could stop the demise of MG Rover in the mid 2000s. And that's sad because they did come out with some pretty damn cool and unusual stuff and I can't help but think what they'd have made if they'd lasted a bit longer. And what I've got here today is a possible preview of what might have come next. This is an MG ZT. It is MG's version of the Rover 75. Now if you're watching this from across the pond you may have absolutely no idea what any of that means. Well the Rover 75 was Rover's big executive luxury saloon car and the MG was the sportier version of that. Now the problem is that MG always suffered from its association with Rover. Essentially they were seen as cars for old people that really didn't care anymore. But that's kind of sad because actually under the skin these were really really well engineered and quite well thought out cars. They were just hobbled by decades of association with uncool brands like Honda and yes I know to some of us petrol heads Honda is a cool brand but to most British people in the late 90s it wasn't a good thing. However the people at MG Rover decided that they wanted to spice things up a bit and so they created this. Now to the untrained eye it is essentially nothing unusual it is an MG ZT. The only exterior clue as to what's different about this car can be seen on the wings and on the back because you have a badge on the back saying ZT260 and on the side you have a little one saying V8. There you go. Under here, this car has had an upgrade from the previous best, which was a 2.5 litre, 190 horsepower V6, to a 4.6 litre Ford Modular V8, lifted straight from the Mustang of the time. Now, there's a slight problem there, you see, because all of the MG Rover products of the time were front wheel drive, and this powertrain is set up for rear wheel drive. Don't worry, they didn't convert a V8 Mustang into a front wheel drive heap. Oh no, they did it the much more complicated and difficult way. They totally re-engineered the rear of the car to make this the only rear wheel drive Rover 75 slash MGZT, whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, the 260 in the name relates to the power output. This engine, despite its generous capacity, produces only 260 horsepower and about 300 pound-foot of torque. Figures that weren't very impressive even back then. It took an enterprising Scotsman named Brian Lutie, also known as Scooter in the online community, to fix this problem. He tempted over Mustang tuning specialist Sean Heinlein from the USA with the lure of some fine Scottish produce to help pep the car up a bit. The result was this, a Kenny Bell twin screw supercharger installation on top of the existing 4.6 litre V8 to bring those power figures up to a much more respectable 400 horsepower and 400 pound foot of torque. Now not every car wound up having those exact numbers because there were an awful lot of variables at play, mostly due to the nature of the Mustang engines of the time. But the aim was that each car would have about 800 in total, meaning you'd have 
maybe 380 horsepower, but 420 pound foot, something like this. This exact car hasn't been dynoed simply because there was no time, but that was part of the process. Now, this install wasn't particularly cheap, being around 7,000 pounds on top of a car that isn't especially expensive to buy. For that reason, fewer than 25 of these installations were ever carried out. And there was one factory-created Roush installation which has a little bit less power and used a different type of supercharger that is, to this day, still running around surprising BMWs everywhere. You have to remember, when this was being developed, the current M5 was just about the E39, and that was the target used for this. They wanted to create something which could keep an E39 M5 honest but still looked like it might be grandma's favorite. And I think, by the looks of it, they've succeeded. The inside is somewhat unremarkable and really does continue the Q car theme. This is, if ever there were one, a true sleeper. Very, very few people even know that this existed and even fewer appreciate what it actually is. Now, I haven't actually driven a 75, a ZT, or a 260, and I certainly haven't driven one of these before, so I'm especially grateful to Stephen for bringing it down today. And we're gonna get out there, and it's a bit greasy and slippy, and we're gonna find out just what this lovely slice of simple, good old-fashioned petrol head V8 fun can do. Now, it probably tells me a lot about how much cars have changed when I get in this and it doesn't actually feel as large as it probably should. When this car was new, it was very much a rival to something like a 5 Series or a Jag XJ of the time, and actually, it doesn't feel as big as a modern 4 Series because, well, it probably isn't. It's certainly nowhere near as gargantuan as, say, a modern 5 Series, and. Uh, it's just the way that cars have gone, which means that when you're trying to navigate down these slightly narrow roads, it's actually not too bad to place. You have a surprising amount of bonnet in your view, which is always a very, very good thing. Now, the one piece of advice I was given about this car is to not rush the gearbox, and so I'm taking it fairly gently, and you can tell that it likes that. It's got a really, really nice feel to it. The clutch is taking a little bit of getting used to, and I've got to say, this is making an absolutely delightful sound. Of course, one of the great things about superchargers is that unlike their turbo cousins, they don't rob any of that glorious oral stimulation that us petrol heads do crave. Believe it or not, that exhaust is standard. This car, other than the supercharger install, is completely stock. In here, it's a kind of odd thing. You have these oval dials, which MG Rover seemed to be really fond of for some reason at the time. Don't know why, they just had a thing for it. And beyond the glorious noise and V8 badge, you have absolutely no idea what you're driving. Rover did a few of these in automatic, but honestly, why would you? You can actually heel and tow very easily. It's amazing how modern cars in so many ways actually have made driving more difficult for those that care about it. Now the steering, of course, is understandably quite light. But there's still some feel through it, but that really isn't what this car is built for. This is an executive cruiser. Now, helping get that power to the ground is a limited slip differential. Beyond that, there is nothing other than a dose of common sense and a light foot to keep the car in a straight line. No traction control to save me from myself. Really, thus far, this is just a lovely thing to be in. The seats are very comfortable. They're a mixture of leather and sort of an Alcantara type fabric, which they're dyed green. The car itself is black uh, with a bit of metallic in it. I thought it might have been perhaps a British Racing Green or so, because you do occasionally get those in incredibly dark shades, but no, it, it is black. MG at the time also did some very, very fruity colours, a lot of them quite similar to the TVR colours you may have seen, those flip or reflex colours, and I've known a few of those about the place. 
Now this car and its cousin, the 75, can be had for very, very reasonable money. Of course the 260s are going to command a premium still being worth anywhere between five, 12,000 pounds, possibly more, really depends on what's been done to them and so on, bearing in mind that, you know, the supercharger install is an expensive thing to do. You get plenty of supercharger wine. Oh, now that's interesting. So. Another connection to TVR and something that as a modern car driver you might miss, if you want the full performance that this thing has to offer, you really got to press down on that accelerator pedal. I was pressing it about halfway and then just decided to put my foot all the way to the floor to see what happened and it actually really, really picked up, actually quite impressively. And that's something that TVR did in lieu of traction control, they simply gave you a very long throttle pedal. I suppose the idea being that if you managed to spin the car up that, well, it was your fault because you asked for it. Modern cars, on the other hand, tend to go too far the other way, whereas you get everything in the tiniest, tiniest amount of travel. And when you've got, say, big, torquey, turbocharged engines, I think that's just not a very good combination. Let people drive properly, I say. If you took those V8 badges off, it's the most unassuming car you could possibly imagine. And, and that really is the appeal. I suppose the truth of the matter is probably their MG Rover was so utterly and totally skint that at the time they couldn't afford to do anything fancy in terms of body work and making it wide arched and doing different panels and stuff like that. They just didn't have the budget. I suspect the V8 badges were probably about as flashy as they could go, otherwise they'd have been broken. As it turns out, they were broke. If you're interested in automotive history, there's a lot of stories to be found online as to why and how exactly MG Rover died, and there's a lot of people seem to want to place the blame at BMW's feet. You see, everyone knows, of course, the BMW very much wanted some things from Land Rover, which was part of the same group, and they also wanted the Mini brand. Mini, of course, being owned by MG Rover, and Mini now being one of BMW's greatest successes. Now the engine will go to about 6,000 RPM but truthfully its best work is already done and gone by about 5,500 but that's fine it's the sort of character that you expect again from an American V8. Bear in mind this is only a two valve per cylinder engine it is not fancy at all. <laughs> They built something they wanted to go like an M5. It goes like an M5. That's amazing. Look, this car was designed and built by MG Rover in essentially the late 90s, early noughties. The supercharger setup is oh, a decade old essentially but it's lovely. Oh yes, you just, it's that last, the last little smidgen of the accelerator pedal just suddenly just unleashes something else. It's almost like there's a kick down switch hiding down there, but there's not obviously because this is a manual car. I've never really known anything like it. This is really an addictive little thing. The great thing about it which I hinted at earlier, is the fact that you would think that running one of these with its bespoke nature and its manufacturer that for all intents and purposes no longer exists. Yes, MG have come back, but they are not the company that they were. You'd think running one of these, and especially if it breaks, is going to be really expensive. Well, actually, I'm told that the opposite is true. You see, there's a very, very dedicated group of people that own these cars, most of whom are members of something called the 260s Club. 
named, I think, for very obvious reasons, and they will get together. And if there are parts that are no longer easy to get, you know, a large part of the car is, of course, going to be stuff that you can get relatively easily because it will have been used across many cars in the lineup. And in fact, some of these cars even had a lot of BMW bits in them. I've seen some of these which have BMW sat nav and so on. The diesel versions of these used a BMW engine. So that's a fairly easy thing, of course, to source parts for. Now, it having a lot of Mustang bits does mean that some of these things can, of course, be sourced easily as any Mustang part. The only annoying bit there being, of course, shipping from America. But the owner's club will bandy together and do group buys of things so that you can keep your car on the road for relatively little. It's cost about £20,000 to run over the last 10 years, including buying it, upgrading it with the supercharger and fixing all of the problems. I mean, that's, that's a bargain. That's an actual proper bargain. And a 320D doesn't sound like this. Earlier, this car's owner asked me, he's been watching the channel for a while, and actually I've, I've known him sort of for quite some time because I sold him my grandmother's old Jeep many, many moons ago. And I know his son is desperate to inherit this car or at least pinch it off his dad whenever he can. And I can understand that. And Steve asked me, he said, what's one of the most surprising, nice cars that you've sort of driven on the channel? And I said, the RX-7, because it's a car that I never, re I knew about, that I never really wanted or lusted for or anything else, but it just really pleasantly surprised me. Well, I'm happy to say that this can join the RX-7 in the list of cars that I sort of knew existed, but kind of hadn't really paid much attention to, and actually has been a real, real nice surprise. So there you have it, Britain's Mustang sort of M5 kind of thing. The MG ZT, formerly 260, now 400. M5 rival? Maybe. XJ rival? Oh yeah. Cool? Absolutely. If you're a fan of old Top Gear, I think this deserves a space in the fridge with the DB9. You know when there's that unassuming old man at a party? And you're kind of like, ah, oh, look at that old guy. And then someone tells you, yeah, you do realize he's in the SAS. And you're like, oh shit. That's this car. I love it. Thanks for watching, guys. Please hit like, comment below, tell me what you think of the car and what you think its best driver would be. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. It really does make a big difference to me and the channel. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.